Namaste. So, now we have come to the last lecture of this course which is the third revision lecture. So, here we looked at, uh, so we are going to begin with legal aspects of capture and restraint. So, we had a look at the Indian Forest Act of 1927. The most important act for us is the Wildlife Protection Act. Now, in this case section 2 is the most important one uh, which defines animal article hunting. So, hunting includes killing or poisoning, capturing, snaring, trapping, baiting, every attempt to do all of these. So, essentially when you are setting up a trap that is hunting under the Wildlife Protection Act. Then it defines meat, so meat includes blood, fl fat, flesh and so on. Weapon includes firearms, hooks, nets, poison, snares, traps and any other equipment or apparatus that is capable of anesthetizing, decoying, destroying, injuring or killing of an animal. So, essentially when we look at these definitions we can understand that most of the things that we are doing in the name of captioning of animals are prohibited and they are regulated unless explicitly permitted. And then uh, hunting is prohibited and then permission of hunting can be had through section 11 and in the case of uh, the section 12. So, this talks about who grants the permits and then there are different situations for which permits can be granted. Schedule 1 animals and schedule 2 animals are given more preference. So, schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 and other animals are given a less preference. Then you have restriction on entries, destruction etc is prohibited and so on. Declaration of national parks, wild animals etc are government property. And then section 62 is a very important section. It talks about the declaration of certain wild animals to be vermins. And here also it says declare any wild animal other than those specified in schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2. Now, the next important act is the prevention of cruelty to animals act of 1960. Now, in this case treating animals cruelly is defined very clearly. Now, in the case of R situations, so it says 17 m is solely with a uh, view of providing uh, to providing entertainment confines or causes any animal to be confined including tying of an animal as a bait or in the uh, in a tiger or other sanctuary. Now, the point here to note is that if you are using an animal as a bait that is not explicitly prohibited, but only when you are using it as a bait for the purpose of entertainment and entertainment alone. Then it also regulates experimentation of animals, there is a committee, the duties are defined and so on. The next important act is the arms act of 1959. So, here it defines arms and firearms. Now, in this case, these two points are important. Immobilization guns are firearms as per the definition and arms also includes firearms. So, basically uh, the immobilization guns are firearms and as well as they are arms. Next is the Indian Electricity Act, the Indian Veterinary Council Act. Now, Indian Veterinary Council Act very clearly mentions that if you are uh, giving any drug to, an, to a wild animal, you need to have uh, a registration with the veterinary council and which also means that you need to have a degree in veterinary science and medicine. Then you have the drugs and cosmetics act. So, whenever we are importing or manufacturing or transporting any of our drugs mostly are not. So, they are regulated under this act and also under the narcotics and the psychotropic substances act. So, especially when we are talking about immobilizing drugs a number of them are narcotics. So, the provisions of this act also apply to them. So, the important sections are already highlighted and next is the Indian Wireless Telegraphy Act, the draft guidelines for the use of drones. So, these are the important acts and regulations that are required here. So, next we looked at other topics in capture and restraint. So, when we are designing trap cages, how should they be designed? then transport of captive animals and all of these are governed by the CZA guidelines. And next we have the, the human safety concerns. So, whenever you are capturing a wild animal or whenever you are immobilizing a wild animal or whether you are working with a wild animal, you need to take care of environmental risk, disease risk, equipment related risk, drug related risk, animal related risk and evacuation protocols. 
So the next module was conservation genetics. So we began with what is conservation genetics? So it is conservation biology plus genetics or a branch of science that aims to understand the dynamics of genes in populations principally to avoid extinction. Then we looked at what is genetics, what is a gene, what is a chromosome, what is allele, what is a trait, what is genotype, what is phenotype. Then we had the laws of uh, Mendelian genetics, law of dominance, law of segregation, law of independent assortment. Then we looked at all different Punnett squares. Then we looked at co-dominance and incomplete dominance and then some topics in conservation genetics. So conservation genetics is important because we are doing things such as DNA cell line cryobanking, then chromosomal analysis, karyotype analysis, population genetics, DNA sequencing, barcoding and so on. Next we had a look at population genetics. So what is a population? A population is a localized group of individuals that are capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. So we looked at different populations giving the examples of tigers from Madhya Pradesh and tigers from Sundarbans or say tigers from Mudumalai. So all of these are different populations of tigers and population genetics ask the, the question uh, how populations are changing genetically over time. So we looked at this example of the peppered moth. So in this example earlier when there was less amount of pollution, so the barks of the trees were light in color and so out of these two uh, vari varieties of peppered moth, the, uh, the melanistic variety was very clearly visible but the whitish variety or the lighter colored variety it became very easily camouflaged. So both of these traits were present both of these phenotypes were present in the population but then this one was more dominant. Now later on when uh, the area became more polluted and soot covered all of these uh, tree branch uh, tree barks, so the lighter variety became more conspicuous and the darker variety became less conspicuous. So this is how uh, population genetics works in response to the environment then it is related with evolution then we looked at adaptation and genetic adaptation. So genetic adaptation is an inheritable fitness. Then we define fitness as the ability of a particular organism to leave descendants in future generations relative to other organisms. So evolution tends to maximize the fitness. So fitness we looked at different characteristics of fitness and then we defined natural selection. The process in nature by which only those organisms best adapted to the environment tend to survive and transmit their genetic characteristics to the succeeding generations while those less adapted tend to be eliminated. So this is natural selection and it occurs in five steps. One is variation. So all the individuals are not identical, they have different characteristics. So for instance, the dark variety of peppered moth and the light variety of peppered moth. Then we had overpopulation, so organisms tend to produce excess number of offsprings. And then there is a struggle for existence because the resources are limited, but then we have excess number of offsprings that need to be accommodated. So then because of this struggle, only a few organisms are able to survive, so it says survival of the fittest and then because of this survival of the fittest, these organisms are able to pass on their genes to the next generation, so there is a change in the gene pool and so this is how the natural selection occurs. Next we define gene pool as the total aggregate of genes in a population at any one time and allele frequency as the proportion of an allele in the population. So we looked at how allele frequencies are calculated. Hardy-Weinberg principle is a very important principle. It says allele and genotypic frequencies in a population will remain constant from generation to generation in the absence of other evolutionary influences. So basically if evolution is not taking place then allele frequencies and genotype frequencies will remain constant for every generation. Then we looked at how evolution occurs. So evolution occurs if there is a non-random mating, if there is a selection of mates, if there is mutation, uh, if there is selection of individuals, if there is a mutation, if there is migration and if there is a small population effect. So which is shown here in the, uh, in the example of genetic drift. So here you have all these different varieties that are available in your gene pool, but then if you take only these ones for the next generation, so the allelic frequency changes in the gene pool. So this is an example of genetic drift. Next we looked at chromosomal and genetic disorders and inbreeding. So we had defined chromosome in the last lecture, here we looked at chromosomal disorders. So we have numerical disorders and structural abnormalities, so these are the varieties. Then genetic disorders, you have a gene that does not work, a gene that does extra work or a gene that does a different work. 
now inbreeding is mating of individuals that are genetically related now this becomes very important in the case of smaller populations where most of the uh, individuals are already related so some organisms prefer mating with their relatives and uh, some are forced into inbreeding now what are the impacts of in inbreeding so this paper showed us that in the case of cheetahs if you have unrelated individuals then there is 26% infant mortality uh, for the related organisms there is 44% infant mortality so infant mortality goes up next we had this case study of isle royal wolves which because of their smaller populations and inbreeding are now showing a number of abnormalities such as stillbirths or abortions opaque eyes hunchback because of which they are not able to hunt properly in the case of other small populations such as cheetahs so we are observing things such as microcephalic uh, sperms bicephalic sperms biflagellate sperms and even in the case of lions we are observing very similar things so there are a number of abnormalities seen in the sperms and then uh, we looked at this case study in which diseases spread very quickly in the case of genetically similar animals because there is hardly any difference in the immune response next we had a look at the population viability analysis so we defined population viability as the ability of a population to persist or to avoid extinction so we looked at population viability analysis so two kinds of factors deterministic factors and stochastic factors we have discussed this before and next uh, in the case of uh, population viability analysis you use any methodology to determine a minimum viable population or the size at which the population has a 99% probability of persistence for 1000 years and then these are different terms and there are three ways one is using the field data or empirical observations of what happens at different population sizes second is using mathematical models and third is using computer simulations now in the case of computer simulations you also require a mathematical model to work in the background and you also require a quantification of the threats to extinction so we looked at this software called vortex and also it's another version called eddy that can be used for population viability analysis and now this is being used for a number of other studies as well next we looked at reintroductions and outbreeding so translocation is the movement of animals from one place to another reintroduction is re-establishment of a species into an area that where it was earlier present but is now not present reinforcement is when you are trying to increase the number of animals in a certain area introduction is when you are trying to introduce a species into an area where it was never found before so next we talked about genetic rescue so this was the example from the isle royal wolves when a single individual came in uh, into this uh, very inbred population so there was some amount of genetic vigor that was observed now next we ask this question how diverse should the rescuer be so in the case of outbreeding so you are bringing in individuals that are having unrelated genetic material so you can have outbreeding enhancement or outbreeding depression so we are always looking for outbreeding enhancement but outbreeding depression needs to be reduced now we looked at two examples through which we can have outbreeding depression so in the case of uh, ibex it's a goat and we looked at this goat that was living in very cold areas and when it was outbred with other goats that were coming from warmer areas so uh, it gave birth in very cold seasons because of which the offsprings died and in the case of roebuck we had uh, a case in which uh, the siberian race was introduced the siberian race was much bigger so when uh, the females got impregnated the fetuses were so large that they, that they were not able to come out and so the fetus died and the mother also died so these are two examples of uh, outbreeding then we looked at different planning preparation and release stage activities post release activities the next module was ex situ conservation so we defined what is in situ conservation in situ is on the site ex situ is off the site so conservation within a natural habitat is in situ conservation outside the natural habitat is ex situ now in the process of in situ conservation we have things like uh, reserves national parks or protected areas then we looked at their advantages and disadvantages in the case of ex situ conservation they are required when you have very few number of individuals so they are critically endangered and you need to provide an urgent intervention and a very focused and intensive intervention then we create the ex situ conservation facilities so it allows a better control of variables there are also a number of disadvantages these are the examples of ex situ conservation zoo aquaria captive breeding facilities botanical gardens bamboo seta which are uh, which are places where bamboos are grown arboreta where uh, where trees are grown together seed banks cryo preservation facilities tissue culture sperm bank ova bank and so on now 
the population growth rate tells us that in certain situations in situ is better in certain situations x situ is better and in certain situations x situ just does not work next we looked at the cost so x situ is in most cases much more costlier but in certain organisms that are having a smaller body size then your x situ cost may, may be lesser than the in situ cost so this gives us a cost benefit analysis of what to prefer in which situation now we looked at uh, creation of uh, x situ conservation stands and the genetic implications so genetic implications are stochastic sampling of alleles so you are just keeping a small subset of the population so a number of uh, alleles might be lost a number of variations may be lost next there is erosion of genetic variation in the absence of natural selection in your x situ facility next is uh, genetic correlations and pleiotropy so when you are selecting for a certain characteristic then some other characteristic may also get selected at the same time which may or may not be useful for you and fourth is the genotype environment interactions so the organisms that are able to survive best in the ex situ conservation environment may not be able to survive that well when they are reintroduced back into the natural environment next we looked at zoos and their management so the definition of zoo it is an establishment where whether stationary or mobile where captive animals are kept for exhibition to the public and it also includes circus and rescue centers but it does not include an establishment of a licensed dealer in captive animals so this comes from our wildlife protection act 1972 we looked at different kinds of zoos central zoo authority maintains an administrative control regulatory control and also a, a role of a facilitator for these different zoos comes up with guidelines and then these are master plan guidelines it also facilitates conservation breeding it helps in the maintenance of stud book for various animals and then we looked at the case study of mysore zoo to look at what goes on in a zoo so there is a cozy environment provided for the animals feeding then timing of feeding exotic animals if you are keeping them then they have exotic requirements that needs to be fulfilled landscape needs to be planned properly you need proper documentation capacity and, and infrastructure building including veterinary facilities research and enrich activities eco friendly activities then waste management what to do with the waste what to do with the dung then um, management of tourists then uh, building of images uh, creating a, a very nice ecosystem for the uh, for the visitors to roam around then puts of innovation and then also a display of uh, plants butterflies orchids birds and so on and we also had a look at the bear rescue facility in agra lion rescue facility bhopal turtle rescue facility in which case uh, the turtle eggs are brought and then raised in, in an enclosure so that uh, dogs are not able to feed on them then we also looked at the need to prevent stereotypes so there is stereotype behavior that is present if there is no environmental enrichment or behavioral enrichment in the zoos so the animals get bored and then they show behaviors that are extremely repetitive so for instance they may just go on moving like this and this or they may just pace around in their uh, small enclosures so these are examples of stereotypes and these need to be prevented next we had a look at botanical gardens so botanical gardens are similar to our normal gardens but then in this case we have a lot of scientific information that is also put in so we looked at hanging gardens of babylon nishad gardens of shrinagar which are examples of normal gardens and then we had a look at christian bok bot botanical garden in cape town as a case study what all things are done in this christian bok gardens so we had different plants and then different kinds of experiences different kinds of learnings that are provided to people so that they become more tuned to the cause of conservation next we looked at seed banks and cryo preservation so we started with these two cases in which a plant was raised back after 30000 years when it was there in the siberian permafrost and another in which there was a seed that was was germinated after this a span of 2000 years when it was kept in a dry condition so keeping things in cool conditions and keeping things in a dry condition both are things that are used to preserve so we began with what is a seed what is the structure of a seed what is the characteristic of a good seed when do you collect seed which trees you collect seeds from then how do you, you collect specifically for conservation what are the requirements for proper seed collection what are the ways of collecting seeds and then what are the other operations that are done next we looked at longevity of various seeds so these are divided into three categories microbiotic so this is small life 
mesobiotic medium life, macrobiotic is large life. So, microbiotic is uh, less than 3 years, mesobiotic is 3 to 15 years and macrobiotic is 15 to 100 years or more than 100 years. So, these are 3 longevity classifications and then there are 2 kinds of seeds that are defined, they are orthodox seeds and recalcitrant seeds. Orthodox seeds are those seeds that do not have a very large amount of oil in them, they are able to tolerate uh, a very low moisture content. So, they can be dried to a moisture content of less than 5 percent and then they can be also stored at low or sub freezing temperatures for very long periods. So, example in fruits are grass seeds or grain seeds or bamboo seeds and so on. Now, in the case of uh, recalcitrant seeds, these are seeds that cannot survive drying below a relatively high moisture content often in the range of 20 to 50 percent and which cannot be successfully stored for long periods especially because they have a, a high concentration of oils in them. Example includes sal seeds. Now, these, uh, these were the natural variations, but longevity also depends on the seed condition, the age of seeds and the storage condition. So, these are things that we play with when we are creating a seed bank. Next, we looked at uh, various principles of seed banking. Uh, so, it should be uh, everything should be identifiable. Uh, maintenance of viability and propagability, genetic integrity, germplasm health, physical security. So, this includes safety from uh, earthquakes, floods, fires, global warming, terrorism and so on. Then availability and use of germplasm for others and availability of information. So, we looked at Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norway that is a, a good example of one such seed bank. And then such cryopreservation, so cryo is low temperature preservation. So, preservation at low temperature this can also be done for animal samples such as sperm, ova, uh, embryos and tissues. So, we looked at this example from Kruger National Park in which we have these chest freezers in which various samples are kept and these can be used later on. Now, in the last module we had a look at the management of changes. So, we looked at 4 different things, we looked at climate change, plastics, oil spills and then we had a Sariska case study of what of how a crisis manifests itself and then how this crisis is, is overcome in the field situations. So, in the case of climate change we looked at what is the climate then uh, classical period of taking averages is 30 years. So, we differentiate between climate and weather, weather is at this particular time point or at any particular time point and climate is an average route value over multiple years typically 30 years. So, there are 5 components of climate land, ocean, ice cover vegetation and atmosphere, these interact with each other to form the climatic system and then climate change is statistically significant variation in the mean state or the variability persisting for an extended period. So, we next look at the working of the climatic system. So, you have the climate system and then if you have any forcings or any inputs that are given to the system, there would be some sort of output which we call as response. Now, these inputs and outputs are important to understand climate change. So, the inputs or the forcings include changes in the plate tectonics, changes in the earth's orbit, changes in the sun's strength and the anthropogenic forcings. So, essentially these are all 4 different things that can bring about a change in the climatic system. And when this change occurs, what are the responses? So, there can be changes in all the 5 components of the climate. So, changes in atmosphere, ocean, vegetation, land surface and in ice. So, all these 5 different things are the responses of climate change. Then we looked at various impacts. So, things may become dry, things may become hot, things may become cold, things may become wet. In the case of floods, you can have more amount of forest fires, you can have uh, more occurrence of diseases, new diseases and so on. Then we looked at this example of uh, how computer simulations can tell us about various responses, uh, different kinds of responses that we can have in our animals as well, different kinds of diseases, thermal extremes, weather disasters, food availability allergens, uh, then more infectious disease exposure, emerging infectious diseases, all these things can show up in our conservation. Uh, uh. Now, next we looked at responses. So, every animal has a tolerable range in which it can survive well. So, in when you provide it with the most optimum situations, you have a greater density of animals. When situations are not that optimum, then there is a less density of animals. And when you go to the extremes, then you will not find any organisms living permanently in those areas. Then we looked at these studies of number of deaths due to extreme weather. Another response is that in, in case temperatures increase, so 
all the animals like these insects that are living at the bottom of the mountains where it is warmer will start moving to the top which is cooler now, but will become warmer when we have a situation of climate change. Also some insects may breed better because situations will be more hot and more moist. Then we looked at actual field scenarios, there is an increased vectorial capacity of Aedes mosquitoes because of climate change. Then we had a look at uh, how our organisms in the forest would respond. So, this is a tawny oil owl success story. So, this is an owl that is present in two variants, the grey color and the brown color. Now, in case you have quite a lot of snow in the trees, so the white or the grey colored owls they become camouflaged and so the, the prey animals like mice or rats or hares are not able to see these owls. So, they become better at uh, hunting. Whereas, in the case of these brown colored owls, the prey animals are able to see them and so they run away. So, generally uh, or say a few decades back, we were observing that in the forest, we had quite a large number of grey colored owls and very less number of brown colored owls. But then because of climate change, now there is less amount of snow and in those scenarios, the grey colored owl becomes more conspicuous and the brown colored owl is able to, uh, to camouflage better. So, now we are seeing a change in the genetic frequencies or the allele frequencies. Now, in place of more number of grey colored owls, now we have less number of grey colored owls and the number of uh, brown colored owls has gone up. So, these are the responses that we will see even in the animal kingdom. Next response would be the uh, increased level of extinctions that we will observe. So, this is a paper from science. Now, what can we do? We can do two things. One is mitigation, the other is adaptation. Mitigation is a human intervention to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks so of uh, greenhouse gases. So, you want to reduce the amount of emission and any emission that is there in the atmosphere, you want to take it away that is mitigation. Adaptation in a natural or human system is the response to actual or expected climatic stimuli or their effects which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. So, in the case of adaptation, you are providing your system a capability to able to resist or respond to climate change. So, both of these things can go on together. Then we looked at mitigation options. So, mitigation options are reduce emissions and create sinks. Reduce emissions through green energy, say use of LED light bulbs, uh, uh, red that is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and so on. Creation of sinks includes things like afforestation, grow more trees, red plus which includes conservation, sustainable management of forest and enhancement of forest carbon stocks. Besides these, a number of other technological things can also be thought of. Now, there are three kinds of adaptation, then we also talked about adaptive capacity, the ability of a system to adjust to climate change, to moderate potential damages, to take advantage of opportunities or to cope with the consequences is adaptive capacity. Then we looked at elements of adaptation, so we have the dimming cycle, PDCA cycle, plan, do, check and act and then we add these two things, observe and assess, so they become the elements of adaptation in the lo longer run. Then adaptation options are create resistance to change, create resilience to change and create a response to change. So, resistance to change is that if you expect that areas will become warmer, so you can create situations in which uh, the number of forest fires that would have gone up are more controlled. So, in this case your forest will be able to resist the change, so reduce the effects of fires or reduce the incidences of fires through better protection for instance. Resilience to change is that when the impacts of climate change come in, the, the system's productivity will go down, but then after a while it should be able to come back. So, that is resilience. So, for this we also go for things like surplus seed and sperm banking. So, when we talk about seed banking, if there is climate change and if a forest is completely obliterated, we can use these seeds to re-establish that forest. So, that is a resilience to change. And third is a response to change. So, you can assist natural adaptations and transitions, you can go for assisted migration of species and so on. So, that is the response to change. Next we looked at maladaptation. So, maladaptation is an adaptation that is not working properly or that is or that has gone wrong. Any changes in natural or human systems that inadvertently increase vulnerability to climatic stimuli or an adaptation that does not succeed in reducing vulnerability, but increases it instead is a maladaptation. Next we looked at plastics in biodiversity, what is a plastic? So, it is a synthetic material made from a wide range of organic polymers that can be molded into shape when soft and then set into a rigid or slightly elastic form. So, we are surrounded by plastics, 
they have a very long history. Then plastic production has been increasing, but the amount of plastics that has been recovered that is that has been recycled or reused is very less. So, what are the options available for these plastics? Reuse and recycle is a very small fraction, otherwise they can be burnt in which case they release greenhouse gases and also toxins such as dioxins. Then you can put them into landfills, but we are already running out of space and then the rest of the plastics will go into the environment which would be terrestrial as well as marine environment. Next we looked at size classification of plastic debris. So, plastic debris that is greater than 2 centimeters in size is macro debris. So, this is greater than 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter or greater than 2 centimeters. Meso debris is middle size. So, this is 5 to 20 millimeters and micro debris is less than 5 millimeters. Next we looked at decomposition of plastic debris, weight of marine plastics. So, you have floating plastics, you have plastics that watch ashore and you have plastics that come on the seabeds. Now, how does it impact wildlife? You can have situations of ingestion in which animals confuse plastics for food and then this plastic completely blocks up the elementary canal and the animal dies because it is not able to get any nutrition. Next is entanglement or smothering of animals. So, this, uh, this is a turtle that has got entangled in a net. Here you have a seal that is whose body is being cut because of this plastic. Then you can have persistent bioaccumulative toxic substances like bisphenol A and brominated uh, flame retardants. Then you can have accumulation and concentration of hydrophobic toxins because plastics provide a hydrophobic substance. So, different hydrophobic substances would come together and so the concentration of uh, various toxins will increase on the surface of plastic and when an animal eats it, then it will get a very high dose of the toxins. Next, it has a potential to alter habitats and behaviors. So, here we looked at different examples and even in the case of our protected areas, even in the case of Manas Tiger Reserve, we are seeing plastic in the rhinoceros dung. Then it also alters the dispersion of organisms. So, these days a number of organisms are able to move because of these plastics and not because of the natural amount of dispersion, dispersal agents that were available before and some of these could even be invasive species. So, how, what can we do to help? reduce, reuse, recycle, lifestyle changes or and alternative materials such as bioplastics. So, here we looked at this bioplastic which has all the properties of or most of the properties of polyethylene. So, this is transparent, this is flexible and then its strength is also much greater than that of your low density polyethylene and with certain other ingredients it can also increase to more than the high density polyethylene. So, such kinds of plastics which are completely biodegradable which can be eaten by animals need to be promoted. Next we had to look at oil spill. So, what is oil spill? It is a release of liquid petroleum hydrocarbon into the environment. It can be terrestrial or marine. So, we looked at these Kuwaiti oil lakes that were created and this is a marine example. This can be natural, accidental or intentional. So, this is a natural oil slick and then next we looked at what is a hydrocarbon. It is an organic compound consisting entirely of hydrogen and carbon. So, there are various hydrocarbons. Next, we define or we classify hydrocarbons based on their specific gravity. So, you have group 1 hydrocarbons that have very low specific gravity, group 5 hydrocarbons that have a very high specific gravity and others come in between. Why is this important? Because those with less specific gravity are going to float on water, those with higher specific gravity are going to sink down. Also, those with less specific gravity will be more volatile, those with higher specific gravity will be less volatile. Next, we looked at three different classifications based on the origin. So, you can have petrogenic which are directly derived from mineral oils. And then if these mineral oils are burnt, then because of incomplete burning, we will have pyrogenic. Pyro is heat. So, this is heat formation, this is rock formation and third is biogenic that is biological formation which is derived from biological processes acting on the mineral oils. Next, we looked at the fate of oil. So, if there is oil, then it will spread. It, this may evaporate, there will be some photo oxidation, there will be some emulsification, some parts will dissolve, some parts will disperse and some parts will sediment down. And then these will coat and uh, these will be ingested by certain organisms. In certain cases, there will be a bioaccumulation, in certain cases, there will be a biodegradation of these oil components. Next, we looked at different impacts. So, impacts upon coating, impacts of dissolved products and then factors influencing the impact, the seasonality. So, if there is an organism in its breeding season, it is, it will have a greater impact. 
and then the ecological function if there is a keystone species then the impact on the ecosystem will be much greater lifestyle factors animals with long life span and key selected reproductive strategy so in this strategy there uh, the animals go for less number of offsprings and give much more attention so if those off offsprings die then there is a very little chance that the same species will be able to cope with this situation and then health and other prevailing conditions in the animals next we had a look at vulnerability and sensitivity so vulnerability is the likelihood that your resource or your animals will be exposed to oil and sensitivity assumes that your resource or the animals are already exposed to oil and then it asks what is the re relative effect of that exposure so there could be some species that will be highly sensitive and there could be some species that are more resistant to the impacts of oil next we looked at toxicity toxicity is divided into two parts acute and chronic toxicity acute toxicity occurs in a very short period of time so if uh, there is an animal that is given say cyanide and this animal dies so this would be a case of acute toxicity chronic toxicity is something that occurs in, in a very long time span so if there is a person who is living in a house that has lead paint so this person is exposed to lead for a very long period of time and will show impacts of chronic toxicity next we looked at exposure exposure route magnitude lethal and sub lethal effect so lethal effect is when an organism dies sub lethal effect is when an organism has a reduced biological function or health next we looked at bioavailability bioaccumulation and impacts of on different animals like planktons seabed life fish marine mammals marine reptiles birds shoreline and coastal habitats when there is an oil spill we go for cleaning operations and our aim is to recover the ecosystem back to its full productivity so these cleaning operations could include clean and contain and scoop operations in which the oil is contained and then it is taken away or you can burn this oil in on the site or you can use dispersants to disperse the oil so these dispersants are very similar to detergents they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail so the tail attaches to the oil globule the head is able to move around in the water and so this is able to break the oil into smaller pieces and then disperse the oil away but then this could also have an other unintended consequences on the uh, habitat or in certain situations if the impact is very less we can just nature act so we we will not do anything or we can just add some fertilizers so that the number of um, naturally acting microorganisms increase and so uh, the action of nature is expedited other strategies are to avoid setting up of rigs in vulnerable spots use better technologies develop better models to anticipate spread rapid response teams and technologies with lots of trials and lots of uh, simulated scenarios and studies of long term impacts and other mitigation options that can be developed now last we looked at crisis and learnings this the sariska case study so sariska is a tiger reserve that is located in the state of rajasthan it has an undulating topography there are forested areas there are non forested areas so tree areas with dense tree, tree canopy areas with less dense tree canopy and if you look around most of the other surrounding areas have very li little amount of tree cover now in this area with undulating topography you have a very heavy footfall of tourists and very good amount of uh, animal diversity plant diversity and a number of other tourist attractions so in this case we saw that we had very different estimates of the number of tigers by the department and as figured out from the direct sightings so departmental methods earlier used the pugmark method which was not that accurate and these are the direct sightings that were reported by the tourists now if you are not using a very good method for quantification then it is possible that even when your tiger numbers are going down or have gone down you will not be able to detect that and this is what happened so and so in this case we have the crisis curve we had a long gestation period in which we were getting uh, uh, tiger skin seizures from a number of places that could be linked to a poacher known as sansar chan but then we could not do anything because there was no way of correlating these tiger skins directly with the areas that is sariska then pre tremor warning came in 2004 when official number of tigers had to be brought down and then there were uh, researchers and students who did not find any tigers and then by 2004 december the media started reporting about post tigers next there was a crisis escalation at this point when the prime minister office set up a task force and this, the cbi was also asked to investigate then there were was this period of investigations 
Now, after the investigations, there were secondary chambers and further, further escalation when WIA, task force and CBI all confirmed that there are no tigers left in Sariska. Then we came to this plateau region in which the reports were, were finally submitted and they contained the recommendations that needs that needed to be uh, used and then we have this resolution phase. So, in the re resolution phase all the recommendations were implemented and you, we had tigers that were translocated to this area from other tiger reserves to recreate this population. So, these tigers were reintroduced to this area. But even after all this there was a damage to reputation because this became a textbook example of, uh, of how things should not be done. Later on this reputation uh, damage was brought down because uh, because of all these translocations and with the better protection strategies, we had a, a good textbook example of how to overcome the crisis. So, we look at uh, turning points and the learnings, there is, is a huge need for protection of the areas, poachers can strike anywhere and at all times. And then mere fear, filling of positions is not enough, you need uh, more active staff, you need more trained staff, there is a need for rationalization of funding and uh, there was a need for revamping of uh, methodologies. So, Pangmark method has now been replaced completely by the camera trapping method and then a need for keeping channels of communication open. So, in this case the project tiger was uh, replaced by the national tiger conservation authority and so that is now providing much better channels of communication. Then need to reanalyze status quo, need for honest reporting of numbers, need to involve tourists. So, essentially conservation is not something that only the forest department is doing or should be doing. Conservation is something that needs to be done by the society at large. So, you can you can and you should ask for information from the tourists, from the students, from researchers, everyone. So, everyone should be able to give us uh, these uh, uh, suggestions. Then there is a need of research to be directed to field level problems, uh, need for rapid settlement of rights, more intelligence, more rationalization of policies, then pro provisioning of immunity to uh, the forest guards need of control over habitat degrading activities and need to improve the habitat productivity and corridor connectivity. So, a number of these recommendations have now been put in place not only for Satiska, but all over the country. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Good luck for the examinations. Do well. Be in touch. Jai Hind.